Research Institute of Science for this uh, invitation to come talk to you and to share with you what we're doing in ResNet. My name is Kate Sharon and I'm in Shrez at Dalhousie and I'm going to be talking, giving a bit of an introduction to the project and then giving a little bit of a taste of what I would call the people stuff that uh, as a social scientist, uh, the role I play on the project. And so first off, ResNet is a network for monitoring, modeling and managing Canada's ecosystem services for sustainability and resilience. So what does that mean? So ES is generally an itemization of the byproducts of natural processes that benefit people. So we kind of consider them nature's services um, while nature's just doing its own thing. Now, there are three categories that are generally assumed to be part of the ResNet of the ecosystem services framework. There's the provisioning stuff. These are the material things that we get like food and water. There's regulating services. These are the kind of the moderating influences that nature can play uh, in terms of climate or carbon. And then there's the non-material stuff, uh, the cultural services, inspiration and education and aesthetics. And, you know, I'll just say right up front, this is highly anthropocentric, absolutely. And it is contested. Lots of really interesting discussions. Um, we don't seek to monetize and try to kind of count and account for these things in ResNet so much, but many people do. Um, so as a social scientist, though, the things that really interest me is not only what's produced, but actually who's benefiting them. Um, are there trade-offs between the actual beneficiary groups as well as between the service groups? So a little bit first about ResNet. ResNet is funded by NSERC, the National Natural Sciences and e Engineering Research Council of Canada. Uh, the Dyke Lands of Bay of Fundy are one of six case studies across the country of production landscapes that have some sort of, you know, complex decision uh, to make. Now, ResNet is asking over the whole network how we can balance the management of these landscapes over the long term using ecosystem services as a tool. And so the landscapes are kind of head down working on that. There are three themes that are also active that kind of help us keep in lockstep a little bit with one another, thinking about you know, governance and modeling and monitoring. And then there's the synthesis team, uh, which is based largely out of McGill with the PI on this project, who's Elena Bennett, uh, an amazing leader. Uh, wonderful to, to work with her. And so what we want to do in landscape one is kind of understand the ecosystem services that are provided by, you know, first the dike lands, that drained area behind um, the dikes. And then, of course, well, what kind of ecosystem services do we get from the dikes themselves? Um, and then what about the tidal wetlands, maybe that lie outside that system? Some of them are foreshore, they're sitting in front of dikes, but not all of them. Now, the dike lands were, of course, created originally by draining tidal wetlands. Um, climate change and the various pressures around that mean that the whole system of dike lands and dikes in the province need to be modernized. And so the kinds of questions we're looking at is, can we use ecosystem services to help us to decide, you know, which dikes really need to be built up and, and, and strengthened? Uh, where do we need to kind of pull some of them back to leave a little bit more uh, room in front to keep them safe? And where is it appropriate to restore more tidal wetlands for some of those um, you know, regulating services? And so when we think about the ecosystem services framework that I showed you earlier, it seems really simple, right? That's what I kind of, uh, you know, we've got the provisioning services of the dike lands and the regulating services of the wetlands, right? but it's not. So <laughs> last year we uh, wrote a review paper where we tried to map what we understood to be the flow of services from the two different landscape types, really the dike lands and all the elements that kind of comprise them at the top and those of the wetlands at the bottom. And of course, we've got an arrow one way here from dike land to wetland because we don't any longer drain wetlands or dike lands. So uh, this is one of those brace yourself moments if I was showing this in a class, the students would all wince. Um, <laughs> but the complexity here is the message. So at the outset of the project, this is how we think um, flow is going from these ecosystem, well, these landscape features to the services on the right-hand side, these um, provisioning cultural and regulating services. Um, so the black lines are the ones that we think are positive, 
Red lines are the ones we think are negative and the dotted are the ones we don't fully understand. Um, supply of all the services across three ecosystem categories are produced though by a mix of anthropogenic actions and natural processes. Um, so are the ones that are anthropogenic or partially anthropogenic, are they still ecosystem services? Uh, I think we can probably acknowledge that there's very few places that the, are unaffected by humans these days. And so we tend to kind of consider them all as somewhat co-created. So just to, I feel like a question like that was burning in somebody's brain. So if we look just at the ones that interest me the most, um, the cultural services, um, we can see that it's surprisingly complicated. Uh, some definitely come from dike lands, and you can tell by the solid lines that those are the ones that we think we know the most about. Um, so dike maintenance, et cetera, provide us access for lots of activities and support that settler identity and heritage tourism. But we think that there's others that will come from the wetlands as well, but they're poorly documented so far. And it's important also to note that the beneficiaries of these different things may differ. And so I'll just call your attention to the settler identity and Mi'kmaq identity that are kind of coming from different directions here. So just a quick uh, talk about some pilot work that we did using Instagram imagery captured um, from Kentville to Grand Pre a couple of years ago. All the posts that mentioned either dikes or wetlands. Now statistical, we did some manual coding and then statistical clustering to find kind of clumps, different kind of photo types. So, so where some of those codes tended to co-occur. And one of the first things that we noticed is that nobody was actually talking about the tidal wetlands in that area. They might have captured a bit of it, but whenever they mentioned marsh or wetland, they were talking about miner's marsh only. Um, and so what we see here is the miner's marsh, the first cluster is the miner's marsh cluster. And that was predominantly males who were taking a lot of photos of birds um, and other wildlife for artistic or educational purposes. So we have a demographic difference here. The females were uh, split between cluster two and cluster four. And what's kind of interesting about this is that we've got um, two very strong dike lands. That's why they're not actually showing up as a code there is because they're split across the two. Very, and both of them are strong dike land, uh, pro dike land constituencies, if you will, um, just in different ways. This one's kind of the cultural heritage value and education. And this one is a little bit more about aesthetic and sense of place and just looking. And then in the middle, we've got people who are walking their dogs or walking with other people. And so we're having, the point here is that there are different demographics. There's no real constituency evident for tidal marsh. The, the freshwater marsh has got a strong male constituency and the dikeland has got a strong uh, female constituency. So, but we need a lot more insight. I don't know about you, but I don't have an Instagram account. So this, we know this doesn't represent everyone. So there's a lot of work underway um, this year. It's an exciting year in my research program. Uh, Emily Wells is working with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq to do collaborative traditional knowledge interviews. Uh, she's already gotten started. Sam Howard is running a population survey around the Upper Bay to understand use and attachment to dike lands, among other things. So if you get a survey from Sam, please do fill it out. And Titi Zhao and Kiana Margison are both working with various kinds of big data and looking at a long longitudinal way to try to understand the impacts of some of the dike realignment work that's been happening at Belcher Street and North Onslow and see if we can kind of track differences in the impacts and how people are using those spaces using big data. Um, so thank you for your time and I'll hand over to Jeremy now. Great, thanks, Kate. I think I'm. Uh, I think this is going to work. Does that look okay? Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. So my name's Jeremy Lundholm, um, and I'm affiliated with St. Mary's University and CB West. So I'm a plant ecologist and a botanist, and so I'm going to talk briefly about the ecological context for the Bay of Fundy dike lands, and also um, what we mean by wetland restoration, because that's one of our key sort of decisions in this in this space. So the dikeland landscape, of course, it's been heavily modified by humans, um, our decisions and our actions over the years. For example, you know, building the Windsor Causeway in the 1960s resulted in the creation of a massive new salt marsh. Um, and this was 
this kind of causeway building was happening all over the province. And now, decades later, we're seeing you know, increased coast, uh, pressure of coastal development. We're also seeing some of that infrastructure, some of those dike lands, uh, some of the dikes starting to fail, and we need to make decisions about these. And bearing in mind that these are really important ecological, environmental, and human, you know, socioeconomic decisions that are going to affect us for the next hundred years at least. So um, it's a really important thing we're working on here. From my perspective as a plant ecologist, I tend to see the world as patches of different kinds of vegetation. All right, so on the, on the left here, our dike lands have different kinds of agricultural fields that are protected by the dike itself. Kate explained this as well. We've got our foreshore marsh, which is really a remnant of what would have been a much larger um, salt marsh complex usually. And so this is a natural system and all you know, integrated by these tidal rivers that flow through our landscape. Um, looking down on the left here, the dikes themselves are really interesting because we've got the dike top, which is usually mown. And so that's heavily, you know, that's part of the recreational context. People use it to hike on. It's also important um, for moving equipment um, and things like that. We've got the dike slope, which is a totally different habitat, not always mown, sometimes um, allowed to become a much more diverse uh, plant community, which has implications for pollinators, which Alana is going to talk about later, and also um, in, in addition to boro pits, which I'm not going to talk about, um, ditches, which often create sort of a, fr a, a thin freshwater wetland fragment um, in a lot of these dike lands as well, which we don't know much about. On the natural side, so the tidal marshes, um, again, which would have occupied a much larger, you know, area in this space, now much smaller, um, also a very diverse set of different habitats, We've got some open water, these ponds uh, or pans, which are important um, for fish and for other species, um, but also a really strong zonation of vegetation going from the lowest elevations where it's inundated most frequently and the most salty with, with seawater up to the, going up to the upland and a regular procession of different plant communities along there. The lowest being Spartina aldoterniflora, which is our smooth cord grass, which is a really important um, salt marsh colonizer and one of the main uh, focal species in our restoration efforts. So when we think about what the dike lands are facing now, climate change is one of our big issues. And, you know, salt marshes really represented a key defense against rising sea level. Um, and of course, now we've lost some of that. These, these protect, you know, some of our key infrastructure, not just the dikes, but also transportation and all that kind of thing. What's also happening behind the dikes, again, with the in increased pressure for development, um, we're getting more flooding events, we're getting stormwater issues, and so behind the dikes all is not well either. In general, coastal communities are facing flooding and erosion, and that's something we all need to deal with. And it's made more challenging because we have lost, you know, approximately 85% of our salt marshes that used to be this buffer between us and the ocean. Um, the dikes that remain that are protecting um, a much of our dike land systems are increasingly expensive to maintain and repair. And so that becomes, as Kate explained, um, part of our decision making. It's like, well, what's the cost of maintaining this particular system? Is it better to restore it to salt marsh? But now I'm going to talk about the, the main context within which we're working here. And this is managed realignment. Um, this is going on in Europe as well, but it's also happening in Eastern North America, anywhere there's, there's dikes essentially. And managed realignment really just means rebuilding the dike farther inland in many cases. So on the right here, this is, here's a new dike inland. And then we breach the old dike, we allow tidal flow to reestablish. And it's that hydrological piece that's the most important um, thing, component of our restoration. And eventually, um, you know, the dike breaches and then you get a new tidal wetland forming and restoring, you know, an area of, of that important habitat. And so this is what this is what we're trying to figure out in ResNet in our landscape is when does it make sense to do the one and the other and which ecosystem services are we trading off when we approach doing this kind of thing. Now managed realignment is much more complex than what I've illustrated here. There's all kinds of different decisions, there's all different options, but most of the projects that I've worked on, you know, seem to follow this trajectory here. Um, the, the great thing we've been working, I've been working on this for, <coughs> excuse me, almost 20 years. Um, the nice thing is if you if you get the hydrology reestablished, the vegetation tends to reestablish on its own. So that's wonderful. Um, it's very different from re restoring some other types of ecosystems I've worked on, but um, it tends to happen very quickly if 
the, the hydrology is correct. Why does this happen so quickly? Well, luckily we still have remnant salt marshes all over the Bay of Fundy. Um, we also have restored marshes as well. And these contribute seeds that float around in the water. They also contribute, sorry, this keeps advancing. Um, they also contribute um, often in the spring, large racks of dead plant material from the previous growing season that wash up on marshes. And these contain seeds as well. Um, and during the winter, other you know, crazy things happen. We get lots of ice forming on some of our marshes. And in some cases, these ice blocks can actually become buoyant and they will actually float around and move large amounts of sediment and viable rhizomes and seeds um, onto new marsh surfaces. And so what you end up with is in many cases, very rapid colonization of Spartina alterniflora, the smooth cord grass, which is our basically the species that will colonize first. And then later on, if we're patient and we do the, the proper observations, we can observe that this zonation will start happening. Um, so Spartina alterniflora will also often colonize way higher in the elevation frame, way higher in the tidal frame than it likes, than it will last in. And so what happens is other species that are poor colonizers will outcompete the Spartina alterniflora up in the higher parts of the tidal frame and you get that nice zonation. Um, how do we know whether a restoration is proceeding um, properly according to plan? We measure a whole bunch of different variables, including key sort of geomorphological um, variables, soils and sediments, and the hydrology are key, but also we track the marsh surface elevation. What we want to see is that surface elevation rising as plants colonize, as sediment gets dumped on the marsh surface, and that rising, that rising elevation is exceeding or at least keeping pace with sea level rise. That's a really important criteria. And that means our, if that's happening, our marsh restoration is sustainable. Of course, we're also monitoring the biota. We have to keep track of the plants, what species are coming in, how much area is being covered and are fish and birds using it. These are really important indicators of ecosystem services. Um, many of our food fish species, the juveniles will actually hang out in salt marshes and eat lots of, you know, whatever they're eating in salt marshes. And so it's a really important habitat in that way as well. And there's all kinds of complex instrument, instrument, instrumentation that we use to get this data, but that's, that's how it works. Um, I'm gonna wrap up soon. Danica is going to talk about carbon sequestration and coastal protection in terms of ongoing research we're involved with. We're really interested in initial site conditions. Um, we've done this on a number of sites and we think that the way the vegetation is configured, what's there before we breach the dikes and before the tide starts to flow in again, can make a big difference into as um, in how quickly the vegetation recovers and in the patterns um, of that recovery, that kind of thing. We've done some experiments on active planting. Like I said earlier, normally the vegetation takes care of itself. We don't have to do anything, but we have established that, you know, if it's not coming back, you can actually intervene and plant plants and that will help as well. Whether that's gonna become a common thing or not, we don't know yet, but it, it's there in our arsenal if we need to use it. Um, likewise, surface roughness is something that, you know, little divots that we dig might be useful for trapping seeds or something like that. But that's, that's all the kind of research that I'm hoping to get into in the next couple of years. And at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to Alana, who's gonna talk about pollinators and pollination. <laughs> 